Our next presentation, the art of mastering the wedge in golf, certainly something that, and you heard uh, yesterday, Jason Duffner, how much time he spends in the short game. That's a very common thing um, out on the tour and certainly with better players. The gentleman that uh, is going to be speaking to us, James Ridyard, he comes all the way from England and is the co-owner of the Short Game Secrets. Uh, please give a nice welcome for James Ridyard. Good morning, everyone. First thing I should say is that I'm unbelievably humbled to be invited to come speak to everyone at this event. There isn't a bigger stage that I could be on or talk to people about um, my research. I actually asked, or I was going to ask to come onto Eye of the Tiger as a nine-year-old child in me. I wanted Eye of the Tiger for my music, but we went for that. And I apologize for the shirt in advance. If you need some sunshine indoors, right? Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the wedge game and what I've learned and what I do. And some of it I think is pretty cool. Some of it's pretty new. Some of it you'll have heard before. But I want it to be practical as well. I want you to be able to take away things that you can do tomorrow. OK, so there's going to be some data and some information. Um, you either like it or you don't. But there's also going to be a lot of practical stuff that you can use on the lesson two tomorrow should you be going there. All right, it's pretty important to me for this. OK. Five years ago, I was stood on the range at the Dunhill Links. I was at Andrews in Scotland. And I'd been working full swing with a player. Um, and we went to the putting green and the chipping green. And he said to me, oh, what's your take on the short game? And to be honest with you, I didn't have a very good answer. Um, and I actually said to him, I don't really do short game. That was the best answer I could give, because I didn't feel confident or comfortable with what I could tell him. I didn't think I could tell him it was going to make tell him anything that was going to make him any better. Um, so I kind of bailed out and said, I don't really do short game. Let's go back to the range. Um, so that experience drove me to start researching and learning and visiting people to try and figure out what I could offer to elite players, average players, your 30 handicaps as well, that may be a little bit different to what everyone else does, a bit different to what I'd learned um, growing up as a child. So it's been a, a fairly long journey and it's continuing. Um, don't think by any means that this is it. There's going to be a lot more to it, a lot more research to be done. But I think the point I'm at now, I'm actually in a position where there is some nice stuff that I can share and stuff that you can take away and use. So let's get stuck in. Did anyone watch Mark Crossfield? <laughs> I just said something he says in every video he ever does by accident. Um, right, DNA of a great wedge shot. The all-encompassing thing um, about good wedge play is spin loft. Everything I talk about today will ultimately come back to spin loft. Um, it's not something I set out to try and base everything around, but once I'd figured things out, I sat down and realized that, that that's the key to a good wedge game. Um, with driver, it gets spoken about a lot. You know, bring your spin loft down, reduce spin, hit up, de-loft it, bring spin loft down, launch it high, spin it low, etc., etc. But with the wedge game, it doesn't really get spoken about enough. Now, it actually controls trajectory, spin, and consistency. All those three subdivisions are controlled by spin loft. You may not think they are right now, but in an hour, hopefully you will. Um, added this slide in yesterday because not everyone in the room may be familiar with the term spin loft. It was coined by the Trackman company. Um, and it's basically the difference between where the club face is oriented at impact versus where the club head is traveling. Okay, so it creates this vector. 
So you have a top vector, top line, bottom, and the measurement between the two is the spin loft. Okay, so with the driver, it's very narrow. Uh, with a wedge, it's much wider. Okay, um, the diagram shows a two-dimensional representation of spin loft. It isn't just these two vectors from the side, though. It's, three, it's actually three-dimensional. Okay, so you have this top vector, bottom vector. They're not lined up usually. Face may be open to path. Face may be closed to path. And that three-dimensional difference increases the spin loft. So in the diagram, I've got dynamic loft and attack angle. It's actually more than that. It's where the face is pointed and where the club head is traveling. Those two. It's not two-dimensional. OK, the first piece of data I want to talk about is the launch angle. How do good wedge players and great wedge players launch the golf ball? Um, there has to be some kind of um, consistency and similarity to what good wedge players do. They don't launch it all over the place. If you, go, if you get to spend time on a range, a tour range, you'll see a very particular flight. Um, and typically, it's from 25 to 35 degrees. Okay, 25 to 35. Um, I tend to teach 30 or try and work towards 30 because it's a, it's a nice number. It's the, the median and pretty straightforward to actually work towards. Um, so we've got these wedges. We've got a 56 degree wedge, 60 degree wedge, and they're all launching at 30, 35 degrees, even 25. So how does that happen? How does this club that's 60 degrees loft launch the ball at 25? There's a number of contributing factors. Dynamic loft, it's where the face is oriented in impact. Um, it should be created by some forward lean of the hosel. Uh, 3D data that's been measured by Rob Neal, Golf Biodynamics, would suggest that the average tour shaft lean is 16 degrees okay, on a pitch shot. So from 30 to 70 yards, 16 degrees of shaft lean. No one on tour is returning it back to vertical. Very few are returning it back to where it started. Everyone is adding some degree of shaft lean at impact. So that brings the launch down a little bit. Attack angle. Attack angle is a contributing factor to launch. Um, with the irons driver, the ball tends to launch more towards the face. But the wedge, the friction coefficient goes up so much that often balls actually launch closer to the trajectory of the club head. So if the club's going down more, that pulls the launch down even more than it would do with an iron, or much more. OK, so attack angle is another contributing factor. Impact location. Lower on the face, you've got some vertical gearing. Top of the head twists forwards, bottom moves back. Brings launch down a little bit more. And then we've got friction. So friction is, is the big one. Um, this is where if you hit off a mat or a very tight lie, uh, friction goes up. There's zero interference between club and ball. Ball shoots out really low, spins a lot. Purely down to friction. No interference, friction goes up. Now, there is a theoretical sweet spot for friction. It's 45 degrees to get the most spin. But from more recent data I've seen, and that's from a, that's from a simulation, by the way, by TrackMan. And simulations are great. I use them. You'll see how I use them in the Smash Factor calculations soon. Um, but they're not always perfect. You know, in practice, it actually appears from the data I've seen that the, the sweet spot for spin generation, which is maximum friction, is actually 50 to 55 with the spin loft. OK, so that magical 30 degree number, how do you work on it if you don't have a track map? Well, I've got a calculation for you. Right, this isn't mine. This, I borrowed this from a guy called Henrik Lundqvist, based in Sweden, very, very good wedge teacher, very, very good full swing teacher. And I saw this maybe four or five years ago in one of his presentations. It's a very simple way you can set up a trajectory gate for a player to work on different launch angles. OK, so in the picture you see we've got two alignment sticks. I usually put some tape across, and then you measure out the distance you're going to hit the ball to the gate, wherever you put the gate, whatever you put the room for, and you do the calculations. So distance multiply, multiply sorry, by 0.58 equals a height of 30 degrees. Now, you work in feet, which makes things a little bit complicated. Metric is easier. OK, so you start to work in feet. You multiply 8 feet by 0.58. That's not going to work, so you have to move 8 feet into inches. 
multiply the number of inches by 0.58, and that gives you the height in inches. So it's, a little, it's more complicated for you, so I'm sorry. But something you can use tomorrow. Okay, this is the, for me, this is the fun stuff, the smash factor stuff. Um, two years ago, wouldn't have had any kind of opinion on, on this or even thought about it, the wedge play. Not something that crossed my mind, but you start to teach more and more players short game, you start to see more patterns. When you see the patterns, you start to try and identify why they're there, um, how you can actually recreate them. So, smash factor, ball speed divided by club speed. Okay, um, maximum theoretical, 1.5 of the driver. The more lofted a club gets, the more oblique the strike gets, the more the smash factor comes down. Okay, we have a relationship between the club, ball speed, and carry. For the longest time, for maybe 12 months, I thought, hey, we can get the club speed, the ball speed, and the carry to match up perfectly with a smash factor of one. So you can see on this image on the screen there that we've got 56 club speed, 56 ball speed, smash factor one, and a carry of 56 yards. This is awesome. Okay, I can get someone to swing at 30, hit it 30, 40, hit it 40, 50, so on and so on. And it's only through some simulations that Frederick Tuxman was kind enough to run for me that I actually learned that it's not possible. Okay, there is a, there is a small zone where this relationship can actually occur. Okay, it's between 45 and 60 yards. I've been kind of hypothesizing that you could do it from 30 to 80. It's just ridiculous. But getting players to do it wasn't the end of the world. They still got better. Okay, as a smash goes up, this um, relationship between club, ball, and carry starts to look like a staircase. Okay, so smash goes up, club speed 56, suddenly the ball speed is 65, the carry is 75. So you start to get this upward relationship. The higher the smash factor goes, the steeper the staircase gets. Okay, with the smash factor going below one, it starts to go down, so the staircase starts to move downwards. Club speed 56, ball speed 50, carry 45, 40. So we start to hypothesize a little bit. And currently, I'd say that bringing the numbers closer together improves distance control via speed awareness. Um, players, especially good players, are unbelievably good at swinging the club at the speed you ask them to. Okay, so if you say 55 miles per hour, if they've got a benchmark, you can tell them what their last swing was. If you say 55, they often hit very close to it. Um, say 60, they'll hit 60. I was teaching a 13-year-old a couple of days ago over here, and I've only done it with good players before. He's a very good, very good junior, but you wouldn't expect him to be able to stand there, and I can say, all right, swing at 58, and he swings at 58. The next four or five balls are 59, 57, 58. He's always within one mile per hour. And players have this incredible speed awareness that we probably don't give them credit for. So if you can bring the smash factor into a controllable area, that um, intuitive speed awareness they have can actually become uh, quite a powerful ally for them. All right, this is the fun slide. Um, there are maybe five people in the world that have seen this so far, five or six. Um, it's a lot more than that now. Can you, actually, can you all actually see this on the screen? There is a, there's a green band, it's very light, slightly washed out, but you can see the lines, which is the important bit. Entitled Optimizing Smash Factor. Okay, I was at the back of the room yesterday and I couldn't really read a lot of the stuff that was on the screen, so I'm quite aware of that. Um, so I'll just go through very gently the little um, key at the bottom right. Okay, the top line, which is purple, is an attack angle of minus six, or all attack angle minus six, smash factor 1.18. So it's the highest smash factor. Black is 1.1, red is 1.02, blue 0.95. Okay, now the dotted line up the graph represents that perfect one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one relationship I spoke about. So when club speed matches carry. Okay, so you can see how the lines move across that, that perfect world scenario that I thought existed every distance. You can see it starts well below and moves well above. Okay, the, the green area is uh, what I call a best fit. So I've given it 10 either side. Okay, so if you can try and stay in that area, you're gonna be pretty good. 
Um, you can see once the smash factor gets above 1.1, it starts to shoot out in that green area far too fast. You end up swinging at 50 miles per hour and suddenly you're hitting it 70. You add five miles per hour onto it because you've got that really steep staircase, ball starts to carry even further. You suck on a few, a few miles an hour, suddenly it's going 10 yards further, 15 yards further. So in reality, one to one to one isn't practical. You could alter smash factor. Um, I worked with a player maybe two months ago and I showed him, I've just got this graph, so I thought it was really cool. He's a pretty smart guy, we're spending the whole day together. And I, I thought, no, I'll share this graph with him so I can explain what I'm doing with him. And he saw it and he said, well, what if I alter smash at the short distances? So I change, I increase it, so I get closer to that dotted line. I get to that middle zone, I use a smash of one. Then I get to the longer shot, so I reduce the smash. Well, you could do. It's pretty complex, why don't you have a go? Um, and he was actually surprisingly good at doing it. I would never teach anybody to ever do it. It's, it's just not worth it. You can try and get somewhere close um, to a best fit rather than have them try and change too many things on the golf course. It's too difficult. Okay, so for me, a smash factor of one is a good fit. You see that they all start very close together at the, the lower end. And one accelerates relatively quickly, but doesn't really get out of that best fit area until you start hitting the ball over 70 yards. So once you're at 70 to 80 yards, you're into full swing territory anyway. Um, so the, the, the damaging effects of the, the smash being too high isn't really too much of an issue. Okay, so for me, above 105 is a little bit too hot. You know, that, that's your player that comes in with a little bit too much lean. Um, their ball speed is a little bit too high and they can swing one ball to the next at the same speed and have a 20 yards difference between their carries. And they don't know why, so smash factor is too high. Lower smash factors, you require too much speed. So if you went down to 0 0.85, 0 0.9, you actually have to hit the ball way too hard to get it to go the distance you want. Okay, distance control. Distance control methods always tend to gravitate towards swing length. So you've got clock faces, and you've got lots of club position relative to the body, hip, ribs, shoulder, head, full, whatever. Um, and it's always been that way, and uh, don't get me wrong, um, I think they ha all have their value, and they're all very good, um, but you still have to control speed. Doesn't matter if you swing to your ribs every day of the week, um, you still have to control the acceleration on the downswing, you still have to control the speed through impact. So it's all still speed relative. The best players at controlling speed will be the best players at using those methods. Okay, so I already mentioned earlier that good players are incredibly good at controlling club speed instinctively. Um, something that surprised me, um, something that surprises players when you actually get them to do it. Impossible to do with a player if you haven't got some kind of feedback, whether it's uh, flight scope, track mode, GC2, you need something to use. Okay, so smash factor is the key to unlocking distance control potential. In order to help them reach this potential, you need to understand how to adjust the club, shot selection, technical variables, in order to control that smash factor consistently. Okay, so how do we go about adjusting the smash? Uh, for me, there are three ways that I try and do it. Um, there's a fourth way, but it's a little bit too difficult for most players. So we've got a little graphic here. We've got low smash at the left, high smash at the right. Okay, so the first one is the obvious. It's club selection. Um, so whatever wedge they're using, uh, the smash is too high, add loft. Smash is too low. Um, sorry, smash is too low, add loft. Smash is too high, take some loft away. Face path relationship. A face open to the path will generally have a lower um, spin loft and smash factor, or a higher spin loft, lower smash factor than a face close to the path. So you start messing around with draws and fades. Um, drawing wedges has become fairly popular, I think, over the past 12 or 18 months. Um, and it's fine, it, it provides a nice shallow angle of attack, which is good, so consistency can increase. Um, but at the same time, you're increasing smash factor. 
And you saw from that, that chart previously that once you use that smash starts to get too high, the distance control suffers. So consistency of strike you may improve by drawing the wedges. Um, you won't spin it more, um, and you will struggle with smash. So once that starts to get too high with the face closed to path, it's not a great thing. I was in South Korea in September, and I didn't see a single player draw a wedge. Uh, every single player, the data they put up, they were cutting their wedges slightly. Uh, smashes barely got above one. Okay, so they were able to be extremely aggressive, spin the ball a lot on fairly nice trajectories. Uh, I, I did ask the question with a couple that spoke English, because very few did. Um, and asked them about drawing wedges, and they kind of looked at me like I was crazy. So it's something they've never really considered or thought about doing. I thought it was fairly telling. Okay, so dynamic loft. So here I'm really referring to how you deliver the club, how you release it, uh, when the shaft actually starts to line up. Uh, where, where's that hosel leaning at impact? What loft are you putting on the ball? Um, so that's a more technical variable that require people to change uh, things in their swing a little bit more than the other two. Face and path is fairly easy. Club selection is the easiest. Dynamic loft is a little more tricky, a little more skilled. So they're actually in the order I would do them as well. Okay, the, the fourth one I mentioned, impact location. Um, all the modeling and the calculations is based on a central strike. Okay, so I try and keep it to a, a fairly central strike with the wedges. Admittedly, it'll be lower on the face than where the center of gravity is. Um, so there'll be some vertical gearing, but the lower you hit it, as long as it's not thin, smash factor drops. The higher you hit it, the face twists forwards, the ball comes off faster, smash factor increases, and you've got the toe and heel strike as well. Out of the toe, the face twists open, the ball speed is lower, heel it tends to twist, ball actually comes off quicker. Okay, so you can mess around with those variables as well, wouldn't recommend it. Okay, so how about some drills? How to control the smash? Um, another question I get asked all the time, uh, I haven't got a track man, how do I measure smash? Well, you don't. That, that's, that's a simple answer. Um, but if you use the trajectory gate that I mentioned earlier, the 30 degree launch, if you set that up and you can control the environment it's hit from, so a nice tight mat, can't really be grass, a very tight lie, the mat has to be firm, it can't bounce, um, good quality ball, good quality club, and you make sure the setup's good, and you may have been on trapman at some point previously with, with the pupil, you can actually get the smash pretty good. If they can hit that 30 degree, degree launch, sorry, off that really controlled environment, the smash won't be too high. So you can do it, but it's, it's a little bit hit and miss. So how to control it. Uh, first drill I would describe is taking the speed off. So more people come to me with a smash factor that is too high than too low. Rarely see the too low. So it's always 1.1, 1.2, it's too much, too much ball speed. So taking the speed off, and very simply what you do is you take a wedge out of the hands, you give them an eight or a nine iron, and you ask the player to hit a high soft shot with that club from a square stance, all right? So they can't open up, they can't try and open the face, it has to be a square face at address, um, square alignment, and ask them to hit a high soft shot. So they actually start to have the club overtake their hands a little bit faster, okay? And the, the one thing you have to make sure you control with this drill is that their head doesn't go backwards through impact too much in order to do it because then the, the strike's gonna be compromised. Okay, so taking the speed off, drill number one. Drill number two, lining the shaft up. Very simple. Um, again, it's to play with too much dynamic loft, too, the, the hosel leaning forwards, too much at impact. A set up, get a club on the ground between the feet. Get them to mirror, or get the shaft on the ground, sorry, to mirror where that club shaft is at address. And ask them at impact to try and line that back up. So this is the player who's leaning the shaft too much. You want to deliver a little bit more dynamic loft. You have them line the shaft up on the shot. Very simple, very straightforward, very effective. Drills for controlling distance. Same speed, different swing. So it's speed awareness. Um, again, not the clock face guys. Well, the clock face guys as well, maybe, but you know, people that don't tend to use it, how do they control swing speed? I want to try and increase awareness for players. So you ask them to try and swing at the same speed with a different length of swing. So you may end up with a swing that's up to the head height versus a swing at hip height. Teach them to control the acceleration into the golf ball, have some awareness from here to here through impact. Okay, very simple training drill, very easy to do. 
need some feedback. Like if you haven't got TrackMan or FlightScope or GC2, I don't have a preference ready, I'm not trying to sell you one. Um, you're gonna struggle with this drill. This one, however, anyone can use. Errorful practice. Okay, so this is get it wrong to get it right. Okay, how often do we stand on the tee and expect people to do things perfectly every single time? We're gonna practice 50 yards, let's hit 10 balls at 50. We're gonna practice 60, 10 balls at 60. Uh, I was in a cinema, seminar, sorry, two years ago, a guy called Gordon Morrison, who's quite a good researcher from the UK, he's a PJ professional. And he introduced me to the idea of errorful practice, so getting it wrong to get it right, and he tested it with putting. Okay, so he had players hit putts from the toe, the heel, and the center. Okay, had Sam Putt Lab out, and wanted to measure and see if he could improve their ability through that. So he did it at lots of different levels. So he'd have them hitting literally an inch away from the sweet spot, so way out the toe, way out the heel, then the center, just to improve their ability to find the center of the golf club. Um, and with the poorer players, that worked really nicely, but the better players actually got worse. Okay, so he had to go back to the drawing board and think about it again, okay? So he actually made the tolerances much tighter. Okay, better player, I want you to hit it two millimeters, three millimeters from the toe, two or three out of the heel, then center. Now, he tightened the tolerances and the players got much better, much, you know, much more quickly. Didn't go backwards. So with the wedges, how do you apply this? Well, you pick your 50 yard target and you have the player hit the ball 60, then 40, then 50. Three ball sequence. Wrong too far, wrong too short, hit the number. Better the player gets, the tighter you bring those numbers in. So you go 55, 45, 50. 52, 48, 50. Um, and you'll be surprised on that third ball just how often players get it bang on, or within a yard or two. Um, doesn't matter the level. So at the same time you're learning how to create or, or to achieve the number you want, you're actually learning what 60 and 40 feel like as well. So you've got two for the price of one. You learn three distances with the sole goal of actually zeroing in on the middle one. Probably one of my favorite drills. Anyone who's seen the videos that I did, know I got it wrong the first time by about a foot. I was very upset for weeks. Okay, so a little bit of info on data. I want to give you a little bit of information on the motion. So give you an idea of where I'm going with how I teach people to play with wedges, um, how I don't teach a single model. I don't think there's room in the wedge game for a single model. People do too many things differently. You can't teach everyone to try and swing their wedges like Steve Stricker, it's just not gonna work. At the same time, you can't teach everyone to swing it like Sergio Garcia, it's not gonna work either. So we end up with this spectrum. We have, for me, one extreme to the other. Four pictures, all different, very different releases, uh, different body positions. You'll see that Sergio is more square at impact than Stricker. Sergio's lead arm on the downswing is in a different position to Stricker. One of them is angled out slightly, one is angled in. Their release point is different, so you see the arc on the way down. Stricker's wider, Sergio's narrower. And these four pictures alone need to start to match up. One of these guys is gonna be able to move his head towards target on the downswing, the other one can have it stationary, even tip back a little bit, excuse me. Okay, so very different styles, different ends of the spectrum, and then there's this whole world in between the two. Okay, but they're, they're obviously both very good wedge players, and they both match up their components very well. So you start to look at the patterns. What do I look at? Just mentioned lead arm alignment, shoulder turn, how the guys release the club. You know, they're, they're the three big things for me. That's like this, the, the triad really, the three things that need to match up for a pattern to be functional. If you can match those things up, you then look at the smaller bits as well. You can move linearly in a different way. You can have different hand paths, different wrist motions. You can release the club in different ways. If you ask Sergio to try and release it like a you probably missed the golf ball. Uh, by the same token, if you asked uh, Stricker to release the club like Sergio, start to get a really short arc on the way through and extend that wrist a lot, he probably missed the golf ball too. Hand path is a big one. Chris, uh, before me, I, I was waiting out back and start to talk a little about a 3D flat spot. So I had to create a very flat, straight trajectory through the golf ball. That comes down to hand path. And the thing is, one end of the spectrum, the Sergio end, he couldn't create a flat spot if you asked him to all day. Just, he could never do it. The components were all wrong. 
okay? Whereas Stricker, because of the nature of his swing, because of his arm alignment, shoulder turn, release point, he could create a much more level, or much straighter attack into the ball. Not just from front view, it's not just level to the ground, he could do it from above, there wouldn't be much of an arc on it either, okay? So trying to teach everybody to try and flatten it, flatten the arcs, not suitable. Everyone can't do it. Okay, which leads me towards some of the green size stuff, so scrambling. Found this quote maybe 12 months ago, saw it in a video clip, um, had to try and find it. Found it, found out who said it. And it's something I saw a lot when I was working on the European tour all the time. Something I started to teach a lot, something I did growing up. Not what I was told to do growing up, but it's what I did. And I think it's what most people do. And there's quite a good golfer said it. Okay, Jack Nicklaus, he was pretty good. So when Jack says something, a long time before I started doing it, he's not the reason why I started teaching it, but when he says it, it's, it's quite nice to hear. And it backed up exactly um, what I saw. Um, so we're going to what I call the vicious cycle. So growing up, um, early teaching as well, Foley talks about giving refunds yesterday. If I had to give refunds for the short game lessons I gave and did this, I would be so broke. Um, the vicious cycle. So person mishits the ball. Ball goes back, handle goes forwards. Hit it heavier, ball goes back, handle goes in further forwards. Hit even worse, and it keeps going on and on and on. Eventually, I start looking like the picture there on the, the right-hand side. Um, problem with this is, attack angle starts to get a little bit too steep when it gets a little bit too extreme. You could have a level attack, by the way, with that shaft angle if everything else matched up, but people don't. Okay, so they're gonna be down too much. The leading edge is gonna be sharp. There's gonna be no bounce. Yeah, they're gonna be struggling to have any margin for error from that position. So the very thing that I used to teach beginners is the thing that starts to hurt them. Okay, it, it kills them. And then they end up with a, even when they strike it, if they're lucky enough to strike it from there, the ball comes off at 100 miles an hour and it goes too far. Um, and then they start to slow down and it gets worse. So that cycle starts to really ramp up. Okay, so there's a little bit of um, illustration of a spectrum with the, the wedges and the pitching and the approach wedges. I do the same thing with the short game. So for me, players should be able to hit pretty much every single shot around the green with the same club. Whether it's a 60 degree, 56, 52, whatever it is, you should be able to do almost everything with it. Players should be able to do almost everything with it. In fact, 95% of the shots, they should be able to play with it. Okay, and you can get a lot of the changes through setup alone. Okay, so spectrum from the left, we've got the lowest trajectory, lowest spin, most run. So yeah, you're gonna say now, but the ball position is back and the handle's forward. That's because it's a speciality shot. Okay, it is not the stock shot. People are taught it as a stock standard shot, but it's not, it shouldn't be. Okay, it should be something they do when they absolutely have to. Um, and what, what you're really doing there is reducing the dynamic loft. So, okay, okay, so you're reducing the dynamic loft, and you want to try and get the attack all fairly shallow. Okay, if you can get a fairly shallow attack with that dynamic loft reduced down, what do you change? Spin loft. Comes right down, trajectory's low, ball releases out. Whether it's a 56, 60 degree, 60 degree, sorry, you can get the ball rolling that way. In the middle, we've got mid trajectory, which actually gives you pretty much the highest spin. Um, we start to see spin lofts up around that 45, 50, and you start to spin it more. Got the shaft fairly vertical, leaning slightly forwards. Ball location central, really nothing special about this standard shot, but it'll be a fairly low to mid flight. Run out will be mid. Forward end of the spectrum, high trajectory. You've got ball position forwards, which is actually created by widening the stance. Okay, shaft leaning back ever so slightly. Gonna be much higher launch. The spin is gonna drop though, because the spin loft gets to a point above where it's optimal, and the ball starts to slide up the face, launches higher, comes down more vertically. So it's a low run out, but it's not because of spin. Okay, now is it as easy as this? Is it as easy as just changing those three pictures? Not really. 
Something else needs to match up for this to work. You need to actually match the angle of the shaft. Okay, so it's the same, same three shots. We've got the back ball position on the left. You see how the shaft is taller, standing closer to it. Okay, so that helps you to have more of an inline, straighter approach into the golf ball. Less movement inside on either side of the shot. Um, attack angle may be slightly steeper, but you need to cancel it out. You're in a position to do so. Having that shaft taller, the arms angled out slightly, can help create that slight flat spot. Okay, so you can play that low spinner, uh, low runner, sorry, low spinner, if you set up the shaft tall. Uh, middle shot, the club is as it's designed. Okay, it's sitting exactly how the designer or the fitter put it to you. And with the high shot, the shaft is lower. Okay, have to lower the shaft on the high shot. Um, one key point here is I'm aiming straight on all of the shots. Okay, when I was growing up, I was taught to stand open. You open the face, you open the stance, you know, cancel one the other out, because you can see the leading edge and the grooves are aiming way out to the right. You must have to turn around, open up a little bit to get the ball at target. But I used to pull the ball all day long, and I had no idea why. Now, if you open the club face on a wedge, the heel of the club will start to raise off the ground a little bit. As it raises up, if you want any kind of comfort, you'll start to lower the shaft. It's almost, it's almost an instinctive thing. People open the face, they lower the shaft. Every degree you lower the shaft with a lofted face, you're moving the face to the left. You've got the face plane tilt. Okay, you start to lower the shaft, the face starts to point further left. So every degree you open it, if you then lower the shaft the correct amount or the right amount, you can have the ball go straight at target no matter where the grooves are pointing. The grooves are meaningless once you open the face and, and start to lower things. Um, the actual true aim of the face is completely different to where the grooves point, so forget about those. You can play every shot from a square stance, which for me is easy. It means on a flop shot, you don't have to aim into the car park. Okay, the arcs. Okay, I'm trying to keep this fairly simple. Um, downswing arcs I've left out. But arc length, again, is matching up with the three shots that I just illustrated. The low runner will have the longest arc, so the club overtakes. I really should go and grab a club, sorry. This will be easier. I actually made the conscious decision today not to pick a club up because I, stand, I fidget with them. I end up with two or three in my hands as well and they go everywhere. Okay, so the longest arc will have the club overtaking the hands the latest, if at all. Okay, so that longest start means you control the way the club head moves through impact and overtakes the hands. Long arc gives you the most shaffling. Okay, for the mid shot, mid arc, you end up with the hands being a little bit closer together, uh, closer to the body, sorry, when the shaft is parallel to the ground. Okay, so you start adjusting the follow through to change the overtaking rate through the shot. Then for the higher, softest shot, the arc gets even shorter, so you end up with the club much closer to your left hip, your left pocket, have it overtake much faster. You can see the body turns are slightly different as well. Um, when you start to overtake faster, the shoulders will tend to slow down earlier. So the transfer of energy to the club happens sooner. Okay, you end up with those negative torques on the body to stop the turn uh, versus a long arc where the shoulders turn more uh, fairly instinctively as well. It's not really something you have to teach unless it's off. Okay, energy transfer. Transferring energy to the golf ball. Um, so what it's all about around the greens. Um, spin loft again, it's at the top. To transfer the least energy to the ball, the spin loft is the highest, makes sense. Okay, most dynamic loft, fastest overtaking. Um, to transfer the most energy to the ball, spin loft is the lowest. You see that long arc shot. Love the highest smash, the ball will come off the club the fastest, roll out the most. Club path, out in. Out in path, face to path, spin loft, increases, less energy, impact location. Toe and low, less energy. Opposite end of the spectrum, the opposite positions, have the ball coming off faster. Okay, now what happens with the wrists? This is where it gets a little, you know, wrist interaction is a dangerous territory. Um, purely because you change one, it changes the others. Okay, unavoidable. But you can kind of try and narrow it down a little bit and. Uh, not absolute, but what happens if I extend my wrist faster, extend the lead wrist faster, overtaking happens earlier, less energy. 
flex mouse through the ball more. Only deviation, so this is an interesting one because in theory it can add speed to the club, but we're not talking speed, we're talking energy transfer, so don't confuse the two. Um, only deviation is the uncocking, so early that happens, early the shaft is going to line up. Um, supination versus pronation. There's a little asterisk, I don't know if you can read it. Um, the most supination of the lead arm would return the shaft theoretically to the most vertical, the earliest, which you know, would add more loft, right? So there's more spin loft, less energy. But at the same time, it could also steepen the attack angle. Okay, you start to supinate too early, you start to steepen the approach into the ball. So it could go either way. And you need to know how they start to work with each other um, in order to figure out what you're doing. But this isn't something to take to lesson T tomorrow. What is something to take to lesson T is the controlling the arc length, where you start to control the wrist motions. I just want you to have a little bit of background on them. Okay, reading lies. Um, I think we assume that players know exactly what the ball's gonna do uh, from different lies. Uh, I think maybe that's giving some players a little bit too much credit. Yeah, sounds a bit harsh, but true. Um, how many players really start to figure out what's gonna happen to their golf ball? How predictable do they make the shot? Um, often it's not predictable enough. You start to, uh, I get players to ask three questions. If they were to play their standard shot, all right, so if I, if I changed nothing, what would happen to the ball? How would it come out from this, from this lie I've got in front of me? If I do nothing special, don't change anything, what would happen? And the three points are, would the ball come out faster or slower, higher or lower, spin more, spin less? If you can ask those three questions and you can actually give, get a reasonable answer to it, if you understand what's gonna to happen to the friction, the launch, the speed, you can start to figure out, can I just do nothing? Can I just play my normal shot and change nothing? Um, is there enough room for me to change nothing? Do I need to actually try and get clever with this? So there's a few examples here, there's a tight lie. Uh, will the ball come out faster or slower? Faster, contact button in the face a little bit lower, it will shoot a touch, higher or lower, more friction, lower, spin more, spin less, it'll spin more, there's more friction. Put some interference in the way, a little bit of grass there. Faster or slower, slower, there's interference from the grass, it'll slow down the ball, it'll slow down the club. Will it come out higher or lower? Higher, less friction, slides up the face, launches up, spin more, spin less, spins less. Now, so you start to factor in what's gonna happen if I just do my normal thing. If that happens, you probably wanna pick up your ball and go home, because you're the unluckiest person on the planet. Okay, another question, um, I get asked all the time, do you teach the same wedge system to everyone? What about your 30 handicapper versus your elite player? Uh, yes, I do, I, just, I teach the same um, conceptual framework, but I teach different levels of it. Okay, so you run through from a, a very basic level through to a tour quality game. Um, not every tour player is in the red. Not every tour player makes it to there, but they'll certainly be purple at least. Okay, they have a lot of predictability over their shots. Um, the ability to read lies, ability to control the trajectory, spin rate of the ball in order to make things more predictable. Very few players on tour, I'd actually say, are in the red. Um, one of them would, would probably be Tiger. And just to bring all this together a little bit, I could get you to cast your mind back to the 16th hole at Memorial. Okay, when he holes out from a lie with grass like this, onto a down slope, water behind, you know, a really, really high tariff shot. Incredibly difficult shot. But what did he do? He needed some height, some elevation, needed to land fairly softly. But did he stand there and play the ball up in his stance, open the face the most, lower the shaft and try and hit it up to the sky? No, he didn't. Okay, he opened the face enough to get some elevation. He actually had the ball a little bit back towards the middle. He wasn't trying to play a big high flop shot. If you put it forwards from that lie, the risk factor was too high. Ball made, it may have slipped too much, shot up too much, 
never, you know, never made it to the green, the, the shot that most of us would hit. But he had it in his mind, he needed some forward momentum, so the ball was back a little bit, it had to, it had to go forwards, but with some loft. Open the face, lower the shaft a little bit, had the ball fairly central. Guaranteed the forward momentum, but at the same time as guaranteeing some kind of launch that's high enough to change the land angle to stop the ball quickly enough. You know, take out of play the water at the back, take out of play all the long grass between me and the green. Okay, he adjusted enough to make sure the, uh, the outcome was fairly predictable. Very few guys at the top end of that pyramid. So uh, this is a question from Scott. Can you go into more detail about setting up the 30 degree launch angle gate drill? Sure, sure. And then he says, how far in front of the player do you set it up? Right, okay, let's get back to that slide. Okay. How far in front of the player do you set it up as far as you want? Okay, but you use the calculation here. Um, <coughs> typically, I set it up at two meters, um, which gives you 1.14 meters off the ground. Okay, but the, the whole, the reason I've given it to you as a calculation is so that you can set it up as far forwards or ahead of the player as you actually want to, as much room as you have. Some players are gonna play on ranges where they can't go out onto the grass much and put it in place. You can stick it in the front of the bay. Some players are gonna have all the room in the world to do it. There's a limit to how tall the alignment sticks are that you put in the ground. Okay, so how far in front um, is up to you. It's dictated by the space, use the calculation, and you'll get that 30 degree launch every time. How far are you trying to hit it? Um, good question. As, as far as you hit a wedge, you should, you should be launching most wedges in that 25 to 35 window, whether it's a 25 yard shot or an 80 yard shot, they're all pretty much in there. Okay, so it should, it should be that kind of trajectory for all distances. It's a lot flatter than most people expect it to be. Much flatter. This is from Chris Meyer. Can you talk more about the friction coefficient and how launch is closer to path than face with wedges? Can I tell more about it? Um, yeah, it's... Uh, Friction with wedges is a, is a highly spoken about area. Um, and there is some discussion as to what actually creates the, the friction between club and ball. Do the grooves matter? Um, yes, they do. The area in between the grooves is incredibly important. So milling on the face, roughness of the face increases the uh, friction. Top edge of the groove, according to the USGA studies, uh, which are published are online, they're there, you can see it. Top edge of the groove is a contributing factor and from testing that I've seen, um, smooth faces or grooveless faces don't spin the ball more than grooved faces. Okay, a lot of thought, you know, you compare it to Formula One tires and how the, they have slick tires to get the most grip around the corners, so surely a grooveless face will spin the ball more, more surface area to grip the ball. Uh, not the case from what I've seen, top edge of the groove is important. And because of that, particular situation with the way the face is set up, so the, the roughness between the grooves, the top edge of the grooves interacting with the ball. Attack angle um, being a little bit steeper than most of the other clubs. The shearing on the ball from the top edge becomes even more important, and then the, the friction starts to really go through the roof, and that's what brings the flight down. Um, I've got data on shots where the ball started maybe 40% between face and path, favoring path. Because I'm talking path, I'm actually talking downwards as well, not just left and right trajectory of the club head. Um, so as that friction increases due to the nature of the wedge's design, it starts to get way, way down towards path. With level attack, it won't be the same, but the, the, the shearing from the steeper attack, it drops down the most. Do you find moving ball position effective to flight and spin? That is from John Gallion. Um, do I find it effective to flight and spin? Um, as in, does it affect it, you think? John? Whether it affects the flight, yes, but not always in the way we expect. Um, example less than a few days ago, uh, same 13-year-old kid, I got to hit the different speeds. He was launching it at 38, 39 degrees, but his ball was back, his hands were forwards. 
Okay, there's an impact location was high up the face. It was up here somewhere. It's taken off flat. We actually moved the ball forwards in his stance, um, which leveled his attack, lowered the contact point in his face, and his, actually his launch angle came down to 30, 32. Um, so yes, it does affect it. Launch and spin, not always in the way you might expect it to. How much, whoa, okay, here we go. Ed Kingston, it got a little dizzy there. What drills would you recommend to achieve the 30 degree launch with a wedge? The gate drill. Pretty simple. Sorry. <laughs> How much flatter should the wedges be for a player? Is a player, and they're still typing, two degrees or whatever? <laughs> it's coming, yeah. is it? Um, how much flatter should the wedges be for a player? Um, depends on, it depends on what they want to do. Uh, just, for the, just for the safety factor, just preventing heel digging at all, a, a little bit flat is nice. Um, but then you've got to bear in mind that that will open the face to path as well. And the face plane tilt starts to go the other way, and spin loft may become too great. So most of my players actually keep fairly standard, fairly, fairly standard as to how they fit. I don't really change that around a great deal to try and prevent the lefts. Um, if they're digging the heel in, there's something else wrong for me. There's probably something else wrong with the motion. They're not getting those components to match up correctly. They're fairly standard. Joe. How about, the, how about the, the shaft of the golf club that you have in there? It, do you tend to match the shaft up to the shafts that they play in all their clubs, or do you try to go a little bit softer? Um, occasionally softer. I wouldn't push them into it. But yeah, I think the, the weighting and the way it works has to match up with um, what they do technique-wise. I was speaking to a, a very high-end club fitter in the UK, actually, a couple of weeks ago. And he was talking about how the, the different weighting in the shafts can make a huge difference to their release profile, how they release it. So a Stricker would have a very different um, shaft profile than a, a Garcia, purely because of the way they release it, how they want to release it. And then he started to ask the question, well, I wonder if what they grew up with actually had an effect on how they play these, these shots. They did the heavier shafts with, with different kick points, different weight, weight profiles, actually almost predetermine how they started to play their shots. Or was it the environment they played them in? So there's some, some pretty cool questions you can ask about you know, what came first with the shafts and, and what you should do to actually try and match it up. From Brian Manzella, do you find when you de-handle drag folks on their short game, it helps their full swing? Good question. Right. Um, another thing that I... The, one of the big things I do when I teach players, um, especially good players with wedges, I always look at their full swing as well. Like I want to see what kind of patterns they have in their full swing, what they're trying to work on. Uh, the last thing I want to do with a player who has uh, a lot of loading on the downswing, which should say just try and keep it simple, is that the last thing I want to do is try and get them to unload it. All right, so Garcia comes to me, I don't get him to try and release it like Stricker. Um, does it have an effect on their full swing? Sometimes positively, sometimes negatively. Um, I, I would hate to try and get someone to do the opposite in their wedge swing than they do in their full swing. I would rather try and match up the components to make what's intrinsic to them functional um, rather than try and get them to do something alien. Because once they get set foot onto the golf course, they're going to want to do everything they normally do. Okay. James, thank you very much. I really appreciate the time.